Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our final installment of the summer session of ACES. Uh, my name is Dave Vitito. I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at John Carroll University and a member of the JCU class of 2000. Tonight, we are excited, maybe a little nervous, but still excited to tackle a topic that is increasingly maligned by the day, hyper-politicized, ever-changing, but never more important, and that's the role of the media in today's society. And we've assembled a panel that we felt could cut through the noise and truly provide a fair assessment of how we consume information and news. Before we introduce our speakers, I wanted to provide a little background on this programming series. The Alumni Continuing Education Series, or ACES for short, was established in the spring of 2013 by the Office of Alumni Relations in the spirit of lifelong learning. The program offers enrichment opportunities for alumni and friends through the expertise of members of the JCU administration, faculty, and alumni community. This summer, for the first time, we've gone online. And with over 1,000 unique registrations for this summer series, it's safe to say our alumni have responded. And we're excited to introduce to you tonight our panel. Dr. Brent Brosman has been on the faculty of the Tim Russert Department of Communications since 1993. He teaches a variety of courses relevant to persuasion, audience, and other dimensions of communication that relate to media and politics. He has analyzed presidential debates for television, radio, and newspaper audiences, and has directed JCU's nationally competitive speech and debate team for 27 years. He serves the university in a variety of other contexts, including as chair of the faculty council and director of the development of our core curriculum. He earned his BA from Texas A&M, his MA from Cal State Fullerton, and a PhD from Kansas University. And Andrew Rafferty, a member of the JCU class of 20, 2009, joined Newsy in June of 2018 as senior politics editor after spending nearly nine years at NBC News. Starting as the inaugural Meet the Press Fellow from John Carroll University, he would go on to contribute to NBC's political coverage in a variety of forms, including stints at Meet the Press, The Today Show, and NBCNews.com. In 2012, he covered the presidential election as a campaign reporter, traveling the country to report on the Republican candidates. Andrew is a native of Buffalo, New York, and has incredibly high hopes for his bills this year. You can follow him on Twitter, at Andrew Rafferty. And finally, our moderator, Dr. Peggy Finucan, a member of the JCU class of 1980. Dr. Finucan chairs the Tim Russert Department for, for Communication at JCU. And after earning her MA in communication research from the University of Iowa, Peggy returned to JCU joining the faculty of the Department of Communication. She would go on to earn a PhD in communication from Kent State University. Peggy's research interests focus on interpersonal uses of media, and she is currently working on a study of college students' use of social media for relational purposes during COVID-19. Peggy also teaches the department's inter inter internship courses and the capstone course. And we are so happy that she and our panelists have given their time out of their busy schedules to be with us tonight. One final note, all are welcome to enter questions in the Q&A chat box and we will get through as many as possible at the end of this discussion. And with that, I will turn things over to you, Dr. Finucan. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. And welcome, everyone. We're glad you've joined us this evening. We have a series of questions that we will start with. And then, um, as Dave mentioned, we'll do the Q&A questions as they come up, uh, definitely at the end. So, um, Brett and Andrew, let's start with, what in your viewpoint makes a news organization or a media outlet credible? Andrew, you wanna go with that? Sure, yeah, you're starting off with the softballs, aren't you, Doctor? <laughs> um, so, I mean, credibility, obviously, um, is something we, as, as we alluded to in the beginning there, uh, has really taken on a new form and a new importance right now, because we, the media credibility certainly uh, was something that we've all been cognizant of for a while, but now we have a present and uh, in, in a, most of, or at least a sizable portion of Congress uh, who attacks the media uh, on almost a daily basis. And so the idea of credibility 
at least when it comes to uh, whether or not you're doing your job well, I think comes down to uh, how media organizations at least treat themselves. Are they, do they hold themselves out to the same standards that they hold others? Because it has been a particularly challenging time uh, in media and especially uh, I think with uh, in the past at least two years, especially, I, I look back to specifically the Me Too movement where you had a number of these very high level uh, mainstream media companies hit with the same scandal that many of their employees were reporting on and how did they uh, exactly handle that internally. And so that's one of the things I think is, is when you talk about credibility of a specific news organization, it can be hard because these newer news organizations are becoming bigger and bigger, the big ones at least, uh, that aren't shrinking away. And so when they come public facing, are they holding themselves to the same standard that they're holding others? I think is a big, is, is a good test. So the research would say that credibility is ultimately defined by two things in any context, really. It's de defined by your competence and it's defined by your sincerity. Do you do your job well and you do it with the best interest of others? Media has been attacked on both of those levels recently. Um, I think that in order to reestablish credibility, they need to continue to do an excellent job of doing what they do, which should be to provide us with truth. We've got to be able to identify the differences between when editorialization is going on and when news is being reported. We have to get better at making those determinations as audiences. Sincerity is a bit more difficult uh, because things have become po so politicized. People have a tendency to follow one set of media or another because it reaffirms whatever it is that they believe. And so they see their media as sincere and all other forms of media as insincere. Uh, I think Andrew was right about a lot of what he said there. Uh, I do think it's interesting that even within itself now, the media is beginning to attack itself. And part of that is media calling out other media, but part of it's even internal, right? I mean, just this last week, uh, President Trump referenced the fake polls that were coming out of Fox News, right? And Fox News coverage split. Some of them were like, no, these are good polls. And some of them were like, yeah, I lie to the pollsters too all the time. And we've got really good evidence on which polls are good out there and which ones aren't. We've got really good people. 538 does an amazing job of tracking the accuracy, the, the lean left and right uh, of these polls and rating. And regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, Fox News polls, they're an A-level station. I mean, A-level polling institution, they do a really good job there. And we should recognize that and be grateful for that. And they have a tendency to be incredibly accurate, independent of what your political views of them might be. But if Fox is attacking itself in the quality of its own polls, when it has really good polls, it's really hard for the media to rebuild its credibility until it quits doing that part as well. Um, because there's no reason for the rest of the audience to give them a lot of credibility if they're hurting it internally. Good, thank you. Um, when you talk about a news outlet or a media outlet um, and, and the selection of stories from the organization, obviously things are gonna be, what they choose will be important. How do they make the decision um, when an organization that identifies itself as anti-partisan wants to include information from their group? Yeah, yeah. So that's a reference to Newsy. If, uh, if folks out there have not uh, heard about Newsy, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's, it's on your some cable uh, channels, but definitely on your Roku, your over your Apple TV, your apps on your phone. Uh, and so Newsy is uh, an organization that hasn't been around too long, about a decade. It's built by Scripps, a great uh, Ohio company. They're our parent company. Uh, and so our tagline is, is anti-partisan. And what that means is uh, it's not that we're against partisanship. Uh, we certainly uh, encourage that when it warrants. But it's, it's really, uh, as, as I think Brent can, can speak to here in a moment, uh, Americans uh, are very much A, in their corners when it comes to media consumption and confirmation bias. Uh, and B, they equate uh, TV and cable and video news um, with what they see on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News. And that is generally, uh, and that's not to castigate all of, all of these um, cable networks, but uh, it's a lot of yelling, it's a lot of outrage content, outrage politics. Um, so Newsy was formed the basis that there is a group of people, generally younger people, but we're actually seeing our demographics that it's not necessarily young people, it's people of all ages, 
who just want to be able to turn on their TVs, open their phones, and know what's going on for the day in a relatively short amount of time without having to hear two people yell at each other for five or 10 minutes. <laughs> so when it comes to our story selection, you know, we're still covering a lot of those big stories. Most of the big stories you're going to see elsewhere. Uh, it's not so much about what stories we cover, but it's about how we cover them. So uh, we don't like to put those so-called talking heads on our air. We don't like to put people uh, who are professional pundits. They certainly have a place and have valuable insights, but uh, I don't need to know what a Republican uh, necessarily always thinks about uh, who's pro-Trump thinks about Trump, and I don't need to know that a Democrat thinks that what Donald Trump did is the worst thing ever. That doesn't get me any closer to having any sort of analytical uh, perception of, of some news story that I may not be familiar with. And so that's what we really strive. We try to find really smart people who can talk about things in a digestible way, but also don't really have their foot uh, in one uh, side of the partisanship or the other. They're people who can really come and bring uh, important and sober and nonpartisan uh, analysis to our viewers. Interesting. Thank you, Brent. If I could direct you as an audience uh, something that might really clarify that difference. You know, there was a program that we ran for years. We didn't run it. It was run nationally for years called Crossfire. You might recall it. And um, the primary host on the left, Ed Begala, and on the right, Tucker Carlson. In one night, they invited John Stewart on to be their guest. And you can still find this online. In this interview, uh, 20 minutes or so they spent with John, uh, with John Stewart has been identified as the reason why the show was ultimately canceled. But if you wanted to see the difference between partisan on the left, partisan on the right, and an anti-partisan, this is what debate ought to look like. This is what conversation ought to look like. This is what a clash of ideas ought to look like. And this is why we need that go watch that video. Um, the problem that we have right now in, in this country, one of the, yeah, there are a lot of problems. One of the problems is, is that the nature of the media has changed, right? They now have to solicit an audience in a way that 20 years ago, they didn't have to do that. And so what's ended up happening is that folks who've identified themselves as conservative media are designing stories, choosing stories that they think will be appealing to conservative media. Folks who think they're reaching out to progressive audiences will design stories accordingly. And if you ever wanna see a good contrast to that, go to Planet Fitness and sit right between the NBC, or sorry, between the monitors that are dedicated to Fox News and the monitors dedicated to CNN and watch the difference of coverage of what's going on simultaneously. Uh, it'll be all you need to see about the different worlds that are being presented. Mm -hmm. Seems to me that for Newsy to be successful, what they've got to hope is that there's this actual meaningful, large enough audience out there that truly cares about that kind of conversation John Stewart was asking about, stripped of left, stripped of right, but let's just discuss the issues and talk about this in a meaningful way. And the more people they can find who are interested in that, the better they'll do. Like the others though, they'll be choosing their stories and crafting their stories with that audience in mind. Yeah. And you know, uh, you're absolutely right. And, and it's one of those things where on paper, if you ask people, are you guys sick of a partisanship? Are you sick of hearing? Absolutely, everyone says yes. But then what do they do when they turn on their TVs at 8 p.m.? And, and do they go to the Rachel Maddow and, and Chris Cuomo and those folks, or do they actually want to sit and, and listen? And, and the reality is it's a lot easier to do what uh, the cable, to have two people go on and yell at each other than move on to the next topic. Yep. And so it's a lot harder to do it in the way that we're doing it. Um, but we think, that, we think that there definitely is an audience out there and as more people kind of discover it, that they'll, they'll be turned on to it. I sure hope you're right. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, and as you talk about this idea of the, the per people seeking out the perspectives that appeal to their own interests, what are some of the dangers of that? What would you perceive as problematic or how can people avoid falling into that pattern? Yeah. Let me go first. Yeah, thanks, Brent. All right. So, all right. So, a um, couple things. First, yeah, we we all have a tendency to suffer from what the researchers call cognitive dissonance. If I find information out there that it's inconsistent with my belief, then that's a threat. That's a challenge, and I have to either reject that or redesign a new story or open up that I might have been wrong about something. Oh, God forbid, I could have been wrong about something and have to rethink mm -hmm. it. And that's the most difficult of the three processes, and it's why we tend not to do it. On the other hand, given the way the internet works and given the way that computers work today, it is easier than ever 
to be able to engage that. You've got to have an open mind. You have to realize that you have a cognitive dissonant view and you have to be willing to put that aside as best you can. And you can work toward a level of objectivity. Um, I'm like a lot of people, I have, a, I have a news feed, the danger of a news feed, the more I subscribe to that news feed, the more stories I click on, then the more stories I get that are just like those stories, right? And the more streamlined my perspective becomes, mm -hmm. that's a problem. So I also make it a point three or four times a week to go ahead and click on my computer and I'm gonna go specifically to Fox News. I'm gonna to go to MSNBC. I'm gonna to go to at least one of the three major networks. I'm gonna to go to NPR. And I'm looking for a couple of things. I'm looking for which stories recur Right? And so if a story is occurring in all of those, I read them and to see the differences between them, try to figure out where the similarities are. Because if all of those different views are presenting the same facts, and that doesn't always happen, but if they are, I feel pretty comfortable with those facts, right? What to do with them becomes more of an internalized issue. When they're covering really different stories, I got to start asking myself, why is that? Why are they looking at this or that or the other? And that's where more of this, the politics begins to play and the, the choices are. But, you know, I even heard today, my sister, my youngest sister is working on an advanced degree at USC in uh, library sciences and was given a project. If you were going to set up some combination group between your public library and some other group, who would be a stakeholder you, she would reach out to? And she said the local media. I'd like to hear what their views are, get, get their perspective. And apparently two other people in that program immediately responded with, why would you do that? You can't trust anything the media says. Fake news. Well, we can't be there either, right? I mean, we've got... <laughs> There, are, there is some fake news out there. There's also some really good news out there and we need to be comparing and contrasting. And if we do that, then we've got a chance. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, and we're seeing this play out in very real ways with how people perceive the coronavirus and what sort of mm -hmm. you know, There's been a number of polls, Pew, Gallup, almost everyone who has put this into a survey has found that folks who are primarily getting their information from Fox News uh, tend to think it's coronavirus is less of a threat. They are less likely to wear masks. They are more likely to uh, rate the government higher and the president higher in the response, where those who get their information from CNN and MSNBC uh, think almost the exact opposite. And so uh, we're used to this being forming our political views, but now we're seeing it in a very real way uh, in influence public health. And so uh, that is a different level of danger. And it's one that we haven't seen before. And I think it is interesting that uh, some of that is eroding as this continues to go on and the president kind of continues to say things that play out to be inaccurate uh, in the most generous sense. Um, but uh, the way that it has in the beginning and the way that the reason why we are where we are with this virus still surging in a lot of places, uh, there's a lot of research. And I think there's going to be a lot of research in the months and years ahead to, uh, that suggests the political ideologies uh, have a direct impact on yeah, very true. Do you see that having uh, impact on other issues in society, um, social justice, uh, police reform, racial equity, or perhaps the campaign, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, you know, putting on my political reporter hat, um, the, the topic de jour at uh, Washington, you know, you say Washington cocktail parties, but now I guess it's virtual Zoom, happy hour <laughs> election. And you have... Um, the president on a nearly daily basis uh, attacking voting by mail. Uh, and so what do we do if we get to November uh, and there is questions about the legitimacy of, uh, of the results. Uh, and so we are all, most of us, uh, regardless of that aside, are preparing for, uh, so we put an election week, which is kind of the best, best scenario if we get it. Uh, a pretty, pretty well uh, rounded out and within a week. Um, but uh, what are the implications of in a, in a country that is one of the staples of this democratic republic is a peaceful transition of power. Uh, and we heard the president over the weekend on Fox News uh, not uh, directly answer a direct question about how he would accept the results. So that is one of the things that uh, we're most uh, in the political campaign sphere uh, has been a uh, top of mind of late because uh, as of this weekend, we'll be just 100 days out to the election, if you can believe it or not. Yeah, thank you. Brent, do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, yes, it, it very clearly impacts social justice issues. It's impacted climate change policy for 30 years, right? That's finally swinging some. Um, but 
at some point, science became politics, and that's probably not good. Um, but no, that's just not good. Uh, we have got to figure out a point, a time where we can get back to disagreeing over policy issues, disagreeing over the best approach to doing something, disagreeing over the advantages and disadvantages, but agreeing at least on what the basic facts are. And right now, because we have large segments of society who simply disregard information if it comes from this source or from that source, we can't even agree on what the facts are. And at that point, it's really difficult to have meaningful conversation, meaningful discussion on anything. Yeah. Definitely. And, and moving from the, or the traditional media, let's talk a little bit about social media platforms. What are your thoughts on the recent decisions by some of those platforms to either flag or take down content that violates their policies against the promotion of abusive behavior? Do they need to do more to stem the spread of falsified information? Brent, what do you... Would you like to I'm gonna go, yeah, I'm going to go with, with yes, because we've had some worst case scenarios. We've seen the role Facebook played inadvertently. It wasn't that Facebook intended to do this. But you know, there's a genocide in Myanmar that's largely spread on disinformation that's presented on Facebook. Uh, that's the worst case scenario of what you can see. But you see an awful lot of that going on here. In the, not the, the genocide, but a lot of misinformation being spouted about a whole host of things. Those are problematic. It's a little difficult. Uh, for obvious reasons, it's a little difficult you know, as to who ends up making you the arbiter of truth. Uh, it's a little difficult when uh, there's, they are so large, it's so difficult to monitor everything. Uh, and so you're going to miss things, there's no doubt about that. But if it is a violation of their stated policies, they have an obligation to uphold their policies. You know, people get upset about freedom of speech and they tend to forget that free speech is a protection against the government taking sanctions against you for something that you said. It's not a right for you to say anything that you want to say at any point in time without fear of repercussion. And as a private entity, others are certainly able and, and are engaging in that. I don't know what else, even if, you took, even if you took their initial efforts out of the equation, when their customers come back and say, you will do this or we will quit investing in you, as folks have been, have been doing, we'll quit going and doing our advertising with you as people, major corporations are doing, then they too have a choice because we all have that right to free speech, right? And so, yeah, I do think that they, they will do more. I think they need to do more. I think it's really difficult still for them to effectively do more. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah. These are, uh, these are, you know, talking about at least Twitter and Facebook, these are companies that were not in any way founded with this in mind. They are in many ways leadership is not mm. for this. And it's been interesting, you know, we talk in, in recent months about um, at least Twitter coming out and putting kind of disclaimers on, on some of the president's tweets. Uh, they earlier this year banned political advertising outright. Facebook has not done the same uh, in either of those regards. Uh, and it is interesting to see how both of these uh, these social media platforms have responded. I think the bigger issue, rather than you know saying whether or not what Trump said violates their service terms or what have you, is just the what we saw in 2016 too late, and that was just very purposeful outside actors seeing opportunities to use these platforms to uh, to disturb and in some cases do worse. Uh, to our own domestic affairs. And so there's been, Facebook certainly has taken a lot of strides to, to try to combat that. But uh, a lot of times we don't know what's happening when it's happening. It's a lot harder yes. to, yeah. to really engage and to understand what's going on until after the fact. And, uh, I think that's a much bigger issue right now than whether or not we should put a label on Trump's tweets. Um, we're going to have a lot of people talking about that, but it's the outside actors uh, using these platforms that I think is has a lot of people in the intelligence community still very much worried. And especially yeah. when they begin to use the deep fake technology more and more, because while while the experts can peel that apart and find that the average viewer not going to be in a position to make a differentiation between what what is real and what someone has concocted. Uh, and that's really problematic. Yeah, not to, not to extend this too much longer, but I was at a conference. There's literally this publication called Campaigns and Elections. There's a publication, there's a group for everything. Uh, and this is all campaign professionals, people who are the hired guns who come in and try to win. And 
that was a huge topic was deep fake technology, both uh, where capabilities, where they are now uh, and how to prevent it. And there's really not a lot of answers. And by the time you think of a way to prevent one thing, they'll yeah. be on the next one. So uh, that's something that again is, is, is something that we talked about a lot a couple of years ago and it's kind of gone away, but I can see it coming. If I could just one more thing. So for yeah. those who are not familiar with it, we now have the technology so that we can recreate vocal patterns for almost any speaker. They're not perfected yet. They're getting better and better. Within mm -hmm. four or five years, you probably won't be able to tell the difference. So you can create anybody's voice, type in what you say and have them say that. We have the technology to change whatever said by making the lips move to correspond with what was said. So all you really need is video of pick your favorite person here and if you have a sample of their voice you can make that person say anything anything and that's a really scary place to be yeah definitely and you know as we as we see changes in media outlets and that such as the cleveland plain deal or our local paper um they've significantly reduced their staff and uh they're pushing content out online how um they're not the only newspaper to do this by any means. It's the whole industry is changing rapidly. But what does this mean for, for example, local news coverage? How will that affect the information we get? Um, and and how, how do citizens get local news in this changing environment? Yeah, I think that's, that's a huge problem. And uh, my former boss, uh, a woman named Margaret Sullivan, I think, just wrote a book on this. But when I say boss, I was an intern at the Buffalo News. <laughs> she was the editor uh, in chief of the paper. So uh, we are, she might not remember all of my brilliance, but um, you know, she is, um, she's now the public editor for the, for the Washington Post uh, and is a very prominent uh, critic of media and uh, one of the real respected voices. And she is, I, I, this has been one of her main issues. And, um, the problems, this is certainly not a new problem. When I was at John Carroll in our communication mm -hmm. classes, we were talking a lot about this. We talked yeah. about, uh, and the whole communication problem. But the, one of the actually interesting phenomenons with this president is people are uh, very engaged in politics, which is good. They're very engaged in the news, but they're very engaged in national news. And actually mm -hmm. a lot of local stations, folks who would turn on their 6 p.m. news to uh, get uh, you know the local rundown uh, are now going to national news because they want to hear about what Trump did that day, uh, and so that was actually one of the interesting things. And then, but I was reading a Pew study pretty recently that people are actually going back to local news to some degree uh, to get their coronavirus information. Uh, mm -hmm. You can figure out what's going on in your local community necessarily from the national news, which is encouraging for them. But uh, the bigger problem uh, is, is much more, and I think is going to be felt, and that is that there just are these, the term is news deserts. There are places in the country, large swaths of the country, where you can't get anything besides state level news. And uh, I think there are some anecdotes where uh, in, in this book about uh, voters who didn't even know, but there was a special election who didn't even know that one of the incumbents was charged with fraud, was charged with corruption. And you just had a less informed electorate, uh, mm -hmm. and, and think about it through a political lens, um, but the implications of that are, are much wide, wider ranging than just elections. It's, it's really, uh, it comes down to watchdog journalism, corruption in local government. Uh, and that's, that is a huge problem that no one has really a good answer to right now. The other okay. part of this problem is a pure financial one. So digital first media is buying papers left and right across the country and then effectively shutting them down. What they've been able to do is do leveraged buyouts of a whole host of local newspapers. They were, right now they've been working for the last couple of months trying to buy USA Today. But they've picked up uh, the Denver Post, for example, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, for example. And what they do when they, when they buy those companies is they take on whatever debt has been incorporated, right? Float the money to pay that, then dump that debt back on the newspaper and see if they can spin their way out. And so any additional cuts they can make in the short term is pure profit for them while the paper continues to plummet. But there's not really much of an incentive 
to keep the paper floating because once it collapses, that debt gets sucked away by whatever that, that newspaper was, not by the people who bought them out. And so it's a, it's a really complicated system, uh, but it's really poor for, or really bad for local news. If you wanna keep your local newspapers up and running, you, you need to pay. You need to, to send in that money, send in that subscription, help them make their ends meet because short of that, and, and we don't like to do a lot of that right? in, the, in the internet world because you can get everything for free. I can read virtually everything that the plane dealer is producing without paying for it. So why would I pay for it? Well, because if I don't in a few years, it, there won't be a plane dealer. So. And then what do you imagine will be our alternatives? It would strictly be the internet and more national and state level loot news? Yeah, I think for a lot of people, they think that they're getting whatever news they need off social media, right? And so, uh, and, and, uh, and there'll always be some level, of, not always, but there will be some community activism kinds of newspapers, some of that, uh, you know, some of the stuff that Carrie Buchanan so actively involved in that will provide some level of, of news as well. Um, but I don't know how many people are going to find all of that. I don't know that that's a good al al alternative. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think you'll just see, as, as Andrew's talking about these these uh, deserts, news deserts, you're going to see more and more places where there just isn't any local news. Yeah, yeah you're in, if, even if you have a, a, a vibrant community of citizen journalists, which is uh, uh, really the not so ideal alternative, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're really dependent on the people who live in that place. I mean, if you have some very uh, ambitious people who are passionate about this, you might be okay. You might be able to get mm -hmm. some uh, news coverage back. Most places certainly won't have them. So the problem then again, where do people go? Either they go to national news or they go to their Facebook or their Twitter or their uh, Reddits and then kind of go down a rabbit hole like that. And so uh, I think there are a huge, huge implications of just the, the fall of local news. And I don't think we're going to have a full spectrum of it for, for quite some time, but I think the impact is certainly being felt now. And if yeah. you don't, you know, if you're not looking for your local news, then you don't really know you need it anymore, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, yeah. you, can live, you can live a life just you know, without that information. You're just not as informed about the things that may be impacting you much more directly than you realize. Mm -hmm. You don't know that your local congressman or local city council is embezzling thousands of dollars. Right. Covering them. I mean, there's just there's just so much stuff that we don't know or that we could potentially be missing out on because just uh, that we don't have the journals. Yeah. And, and citizen journals so that do a good job may not cover the same issues that a professional reporter would. Right. So raises other questions. Um, let's switch our topic of conversation for a little bit and talk about the campaign. Andrew, you mentioned, you know, that where people are getting news for that. And the two major party candidates, Trump and Biden, have very different strategies in terms of delivering their messages to the supporters and to their detractors. What strategies are being employed to cover these campaigns? And does it differ between the candidates? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, just a big picture here for a minute. Uh, Newsy, we, uh, if you would ask me back in January, I had eight reporters on staff who are going to be dedicated to the election. We're going to have somebody following Trump, somebody following the presumptive Democratic nominee, turned out to be Biden. Uh, big newsrooms, big organizations spend years planning for election coverage. And, uh, and that is something that you can reliably say is going to be the top uh, story of that year. Uh, and that has not been the case this year. Uh, and we thought that by now it would be uh, it would be at least 1A, and it's still probably uh, a little bit farther off there. So uh, I think one of the interesting challenges that we face, and we actually had a big conversation about it today because uh, President Trump uh, did another coronavirus task group and those have gone away for a while. And mm -hmm. a lot of media organizations had really struggled, especially in television, um, how to handle this because uh, they would often uh, sway from the coronavirus and turn into very different events. And uh, one of the big criticisms, and it was a very fair criticism of the media in 2016, is that we took uh, all, basically all of the Trump rallies live and gave him, uh, we call it uh, earned media, where he basically just got free airtime on this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do we handle uh, this idea of uh, giving people potentially in, uh, important information about a public health crisis 
versus uh, giving the president a platform to campaign. And this president specifically has, has broken some norms. Uh, last week, he gave an address in the, in the Rose Garden, which was just a, a list of litany of, of grievances against Joe Biden. The Rose Garden generally is not a place where a president will do that. They'll do it on the campaign trail. Now there is no campaign trail. And so uh, the decision we came to today was the fact that uh, Joe Biden also had an event. And so we took that one live and we took the Donald Trump uh, event live. And actually today it was pretty much on message. Uh, he's talked about the coronavirus quite a bit. Uh, and so um, thinking about the equal time between the two candidates and also how do we kind of uh, fact check in, in real time? Uh, and that's something we haven't really figured out. Some networks will cut out in the middle of it and give a little bit more context than go back. Um, and, but that doesn't necessarily work as well either because once the claim is out there, there's a lot of research that says that the claim is going to stick at least in some capacity. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going a little bit better. So it has been a, it has been a little bit of a challenge, uh, but it's something that we continue to work through and trying to give both candidates equal time. It's getting a little bit easier now, but uh, especially when Biden wasn't doing a whole lot, uh, it was particularly tricky. Interesting. Brett? But I think that a lot of that is strategic. I think both presidential candidates now have made the election a referendum on Donald Trump. And for Trump, he's always wanted to control the agenda. He wants to be out in front. He wants to have big rallies, which he's not being able to have. So he's found other ways to, to do some of this. And the media has responded because that's where the story is. Biden, by and large, figuring he's got a lead, seems to be more than willing to stay low, stay quiet, not run the risk of a gaffe, and, and hope that the more Trump says stuff, the more it might ultimately help Biden. And that so far has seemed to work pretty well. It's going to change. It's changed a little bit. He's coming out a little bit more often with, with statements mm -hmm. of different things, of policies. That's going to generate more attention, and rightfully it should. And at some point, he's going to have to name that VP, uh, and that's going to change the nature of the game. But even here, all the discussion going on over who should be the VP and the weighing the pros and the cons, that all helps Biden. It keeps him talk, being talked about. It keeps issues. It helps him figure out who the media would support, who it wouldn't support, maybe who the people would support, who they wouldn't support, without ever having to actually make the decision quite yet. Uh, because once he makes that decision, that changes that from a, to, to a bit of a target and people will respond all, and all over the place about that. And then there'll be a lot more coverage of Biden. And this has been a really weird year. Uh, I guess it's sort of hard no longer being the candidate killer, right? That was back in 2012. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Everyone I covered would just drop out as soon as I showed. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but as you pointed out, and you're absolutely right, there really is no, no, there's no campaigning going on in the traditional way. And so each candidate has chosen a very different strategy for how they want to play that. And I think the media by and large is responding to that. So Trump wants more attention, he's getting more attention. Biden would like to stay low, he's staying low and kind of calling his shots when he wants to come out and say something. Um, I think that will continue for a while. I think it will change some, two things. I think the VP will change that some. And I also think that if the polls get closer together, uh, that will change Biden's decision and he will come out a lot more and that will have both pros and cons, but it will certainly generate a lot more media coverage when he does so. Yeah, and you know, if, if I'm a Democrat right now, uh, Biden is the pretty much the perfect candidate to have in this situation. Going into the Democratic primaries, his name ID is at 98, 99%. People know who Joe Biden is. If they would have nominated mm -hmm. a Pete Buttigieg, even on Elizabeth Warren, you still have a lot of voters that you need to introduce yourself to, and now would not be a great time for that. People at least know Joe Biden. Uh, they're familiar with him. He doesn't necessarily need to build his brand. He has a brand. He just uh, attaches it to Obama. And for now, as, as Dr. Grossman pointed out, only shows that it seems to be working. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we could focus on the Trump administration for a minute, um, they do have a very non-traditional relationship with the media. What are some of the long and short term effects on the media? And just to discuss that, freedom of press, I know we talked briefly about that before, but you know, what does that mean in terms of this relationship that the administration has with media in general? Andrew, do you want to start? Yeah, well, you're right. It has not been a, a traditional uh, relationship between this White House and, and the media, and that has 
has gone back to, to when Trump really uh, came out as a candidate back in 2015. Uh, and it's been a winning strategy for him. And so that's certainly not going to, going to change. I do think, uh, you know, I, I, I think that it hits on a lot of the points that we've talked about so far. And that is the president's constant attacks on the media. The media does a lot of stuff wrong. It deserves to be criticized quite frequently. Uh, but uh, having the president talk in the way that he does, not only uh, to discredit, but to call it the entire industry as, as fake news, which is kind of a funny line and we laugh about it, but uh, it does, I think it bleeds into everything else. It bleeds into Americans faith in an institution. It bleeds into uh, mm -hmm. what Americans think about the coronavirus, whether or not they're gonna listen to what Dr. Anthony Fauci says. Uh, and so the long-term implications, I think, are a little bit broader. And we've seen, this isn't just actually a domestic United States problem. This is a global problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Journalists slaughtered in recent years. Uh, we have seen authoritarian rule on the rise around the world. Uh, and generally, the first thing that they go after is the press and the free press. And so that's a much more troubling thing to a lot of the watchdogs who are keeping an eye on this globally. Uh, and they see, of course, like in the United States, we're not there yet. But we have seen in the most recent protests taking place uh, around the country after George Floyd's death, uh, a lot of aggression towards journalists. A CNN journalist was arrested. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's certainly not uh, to the level of what happened to Jamal Khashoggi or anything like that. Um, but you start to see some of the fraying and it has a lot of people uh, in journalism and, and a lot of proponents of a free press very worried about that. Thank you, Brett. Long-term implications are, are really devastating. And I, I, like you said, you know, media makes mistakes sometimes. We all make mistakes sometimes. The problem is we aren't calling out specific instances. We aren't doing anything specific. We're making these grandiose claims that are effectively never true because no one's always right or always wrong, right? But that's the way that the public seems to be reacting to that. And it's certainly the way that those who scream about fake news tend to present it. And the problem with all of that then is that we don't know what to believe, who to believe, we don't know what to trust. And as I said earlier, you know, if we can't even agree on the basic facts, then we're really mm -hmm. doomed in our ability to make good decisions about things. So we've got to stop it. The problem is, I don't know how we stop it. Um, you know, you vote in November and one of two things is going to happen. Either Donald Trump will have, be able to continue to do this as president of the United States for the next four years, or he won't be president of the United States for the next four years. But that doesn't remove Twitter from his hand. It doesn't remove mm -hmm. his ability to continue to call things fake news and challenge and attack the media at every level, depending upon his whims, right? And we're beginning to see some examples of other politicians doing similar kinds of things, but smaller level, but using the same basic strategy, because as Andrew pointed out, it's worked really well yeah. for him. And so if that strategy continues and continues to be effective, we're in a world of hurt as a nation. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to stop that. Again, we absolutely need to call out anyone who's inaccurate, and incorrect in what they're saying, but, but to throw away entire, uh, entire branches of the media or entire networks or papers or whatever, because you didn't like something that they said, that, that can't continue. We, we got to figure out a way. And here, it's, it's not the politicians that do that. It's us. We, the people, need to do that. Mm -hmm. So that ties in nicely to a question from one of our um, participants. What can the media do to improve critical thinking among consumers of media? The premise of the question is that Trump would not have been elected without the support of those who believe everything Trump says. Brent, Andrew, Brent, you want to start? So yeah, there are actually, there are a lot of things that we can do. Uh, here's what we've noticed though. The research is pretty good that if you go out and attack somebody and say, you're wrong on this, here's my evidence to defend that I'm right and you're incorrect, you've made the wrong decision. It just doubles down on their side. People become even more entrenched, uh, entrenched in what it is that they believe. And so the reality at an individual level is to sit down and, and start talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. It's, you know, here's, 
here's why I, I know that you're a smart person. I know where you're coming from. Here's a really good idea. Here's a way to explore this. Let's think about these kinds of implications, et cetera. And the media can do that on a much larger scale. But the question then becomes who's watching? Usually it's only people who already agree with them, right? So mm -hmm. again, we as educators probably have to take a big step in encouraging our students to begin to look at a cross-section of media and to do so with a, with a valuable place. Uh, one of the guys I really enjoy watching just because he's, I think he's fun. You may disagree entirely, but I, I enjoy John Oliver's Last Week Tonight. And one of the things they've just done in, in the most recent episode is to answer this kind of a question. They have five videos online right now, one from John Cena and there are four others, and they're all designed for you know, a different way of reaching out to someone you know and saying, hey, let's talk about coronavirus. I know you're smart. I know you got it together. I did it, did it, Let's ask some questions. And, you know, in the basic strategy that they're outlining there is exactly what the research would tell us that we need to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the more, the, the more argument, and I hate saying this as a debate coach, but the more <laughs> argumentative, the more logical, you, the more in your face that you are about that, the more counterproductive you are, the more, and the more counterproductive the media would be if that was their mm -hmm. strategy. And yeah, I, I think some of it goes back to that opening question. That is kind of being more transparent. I think media can do a better job of being more transparent about when they're wrong uh, and when they screwed up because those types of things tend to build up. I think, you know, as the most common refrain is that it just becomes a, you know, a front page screw up on, on uh, a Monday becomes a little correction on a Tuesday. And I think there's some faith or some uh, credibility in that the media can certainly do a better job of that. I think, you know, um, most of the big papers have their, as I mentioned, Margaret Sullivan before the New York Times has their own ombudsman type, uh, who takes a critical look uh, at their own papers coverage. I think that's helpful. Um, and then I do think, you know, the media on media kind of, uh, we'll say violence, it's not really violence, but the criticisms uh, is, is really tough because right now we're at a place where we're getting so much criticism uh, from our elected officials. Is it really helpful? for other people uh, to join the firing squad. But I do think that there's a lot of stuff that, that I see and anyone who's reading a newspaper sees that's, uh, that is not necessarily um, up to the standard that we should uh, mm -hmm. hold our media to uh, really make, have an informed electorate. So there more, a little bit more transparency with the media, I think would go a long way too. And, and Brett, to your response about uh, educators, you know, for a long time, we were one of the only industrialized nations in the world that didn't have media literacy as part of a K-12 education. We're getting better, but it's not standardized. And I think starting children early to understand the various aspects of the media and to become critical consumers would go a long way to building on the critical thinking that develops in college. And then as they, people move into, you know, professional lives, they've got the tools um, to really look critically at media and, and become a, cons a, a good consumer of it. Um, so I agree. We could do more with John Carroll along, the, along those lines as well, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. So well, we do have media literacy in our class. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> but the majors get it. <laughs> so we do have another question, um, it, and this is. Uh, it appears to the writer that the media cover the same stories. To some extent, that is reasonable, but I think that there are big stories that don't seem to be touched. One example, the Space Force was created this year, I assume, but don't know with Congress's authorization. We have been peacefully developing a space program since the early 60s. Now we are developing a military to put weapons in space. The consequences boggle the mind, yet no questions from the press. How does this happen? Well, I, um, I think the premise is good. I don't know enough about Space Force, so maybe that kind of goes to, your, to the questioner's point. Um, but I do think that when we talk about bias in the media, we, we tend to think of just right and left. But I think some of the recent events uh, following the death of George Floyd really brought us uh, to also be particularly cognizant of other biases that media have, and that is mm -hmm. that uh, the media is still overwhelmingly white. Uh, the media is still uh, overwhelmingly comes from people with uh, who are middle class, who uh, who have generally kind of generally have the same background. Um, there's and it gets even worse when you get into uh, managers. The management uh, 
Uh, I think it's only in the last survey, I forget the group that does a national survey, was about 18% of newsroom managers were not, were people of color. And so um, there, there's a ton of biases that, uh, that I think exist in the media that only come out uh, when we have some kind of big transformal moment. Uh, and I think there's a lot more that we need to do uh, in order to address those because we do talk a lot about the left right divide and I think most cons news consumers at least have an idea of what the information they're getting what the reputation of uh, the news source is but when it comes to those other things uh, no one has any idea in fact sometimes the the employees in their own newsroom don't know and so uh, more transparency from newsroom management on those things unfortunately it does take a big transformative kind of moment for that to come to light but they're uh, are a number of other biases uh, in news media that are, I think, just as important as their yeah. political ideology. Yeah, thank you. Brent? It is kind of shocking that Netflix is more on top of this than the media is, though, right? Uh, I don't know if you've seen their new show, Space Force, uh, the, the spoof mm -hmm. of all of this. I just did a quick look online. So, you know, there are 20, almost 21 million results, um, but other than the United States Space Force, the, their actual military site being number one, and a brief Wikipedia number two. The next three things are all about the, the Netflix series. Uh, I think a large part of what's going on is as we have downsized media, we have decreased the number of experts, particular areas. This is going along with what Andrew's saying. And 2020 is also just a weird year. Um, you, again, may disagree with me, and that's fine, but I would argue that if we were talking about an economy, at least for a portion of this year, it was the worst it's been since 1928, and if we're talking about pandemics, it's the worst it's been since 1918, and if we're talking about race relations, it's arguably the worst it's been since 68, and that's three worse thans uh, it, all in the same year. Um, this has been a particularly devastating year and really domestic. And so I just, there's also a limited amount of space. There's a limited amount of time on the main newscast. And while I think it's a problem that, you know, even on the cable news, 24 hour news cycles, there's really three or four hours worth of news. And the rest of it is anywhere from editorializing to propagandizing, depending upon which show you happen to be watching. Um, it's just, it's all, I think, gotten crowded out. And I agree that it's absolutely devastating and it's probably a violation of the Outer Space Treaty and it needs to be looked at in, in much more detail. Uh, but our attention is just, as a nation, is rooted on three other major events right now. And we're not paying much attention to almost anything beyond that. I mean, when's the last time an, an election would be pulling f third on that list of topics, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and yet I think a lot of, on a lot of days, it's the third topic. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and Andrew, I think this is one that may be good for you. Um, today, President Trump had his first press conference in weeks. Flipping around the channels, saw that only the local NBC affiliate carried it. CNN didn't, um, and but MSNBC and Fox did. Who makes the decisions? Ties into our previous, about yeah. what we pay attention to, but... Yeah, uh, well, I can't speak to all the, the networks, but uh, generally it's either uh, whatever would be on in that time frame. So in this, like the 5 p.m. time frame, but then generally uh, whoever's the head of uh, the news organization. So at the end of the day for CNN, it would be Jeff Sucker, uh, who's the head of CNN. But, uh, you know, I think it goes to a broader point of, of what we hit on uh, before, and that is there was a point when they started when I think, uh, and I say this with Pretty, um, pretty good confidence that all of the these cable news channels were taking these live. Uh, and then they turned into these kind of hour and a half yeah. where they would go on different tangents. And that's when uh, news directors, both on the local station uh, and the news programmers ahead of these big uh, media conglomerates had conversations about whether or not it was ethical to take them live, uh, what the public good was, uh, and then I do think, I'm sure ratings played into it at some point, but I do, I do think uh, at the end of the day, uh, these decisions are generally made on what they think uh, will best inform their viewership. And I think uh, there was a lot of hesitation when these were announced to be brought back, that it was another attempt by this president who hasn't been able to get out of the campaign trail to have a platform to do his political bidding. As we saw what happened today, that generally wasn't the case. He talked uh, a lot about the coronavirus and was much more mm -hmm. Uh, than he's traditionally been. And so 
I would, if there's another one tomorrow, which I'm not sure if there is or not, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some more folks at least take it live for the first five or 10 minutes, then perhaps dip out uh, and, and kind of incrementally uh, resume that live coverage. Thank you. Um, this speaks, it's all on the same lines. Uh, one of the participants has written, I regularly view the French, Canadian, Swiss, Swiss, Belgium, and British news, and I do not get the same quality of viewpoint and in independent reporting. What's your take on this? Huh. Well, uh, I am not a regular viewer of those organizations. Uh, and I wonder if they're talking about, they don't have the same quality of U.S. domestic uh, affairs, because that would uh, in some ways make sense. A lot of these places have just have small bureaus they were co uh, covering uh, the White House uh, and somewhat Congress, depending on what's going on. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, it's interesting that the building that Newsy is in, uh, when we used to go into the office every day, uh, <laughs> is um, the Kurdistan TV and there's French 24 TV and the Associated Press in our building. Uh, and so it's, it's cool to be surrounded by such a conglomerate of, of international journalists. And that's uh, one of the folks who I, I worked with recently, worked for Japanese television. And so it is amazing uh, when we think of uh, the reach and the importance of what goes on here. It's easy to get cynical. Uh, but when you see the amount of resources that other places around the world are putting on uh, into covering the United States, uh, it, it helps kind of bring you back to the importance of what that is. I'm sorry I couldn't answer this person's question at all, I don't think, but I don't know if Dr. was. <laughs> no, I, I'm unfamiliar with those new sources as well, but I will, I will say this. Um, my understanding of international news, and I, I, again, could easily be wrong here, but my understanding is, is that a lot of those folks are still essentially writing for standards as opposed to writing for audiences. And for a long time, certainly not all of American history, but for a long time, American media wrote for standards as well. And so they weren't really writing for an audience. They were writing for themselves relative to the standards they had established for themselves as to what qu constituted quality media coverage. And when you start writing for audiences as opposed to writing for those standards, it's a very different format and it will have a very different change in style. I don't know that we have a lot of people, we have some, but I don't know that we have a lot of people who are writing for standard anymore. And so what you might be seeing in it there is, is truly a difference between who the perceived audience is um, and whether those are the authors, the media folks are really designing it for meeting their own internal standards as to what constitutes quality news or writing for a particular audience they're trying to entice. I'm guessing that's the difference. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions in about two minutes. <laughs> But uh, let's look at one. This, how does and Brent, you touched on this briefly with the when we were talking about the plain dealer. But how does business invested media outlets such as Sinclair slash Amazon's Washington Post impact our perception, especially of things like COVID nineteen? Uh, to the extent that media are a lot aligned with the folks who run the corporations, it can be substantial. And to the extent that they're not, then not so much. Uh, I'm, an example that I'm going to give that's a little different than that, we've been hearing a lot more about America One, right, and the AON, and a group that has a, an extremely active owner who is extremely conservative and is extremely um, active in the editorialization of what's going on there. And so to the extent that that happens, it, it certainly has an impact. But even in that instance, the most recent article I saw on that suggests that the vast majority of the folks working for him don't share those viewpoints. Uh, and in fact, have a fairly liberal perspective on an individual level. And so while I have not done the research, I have read articles that suggest that if you get up early in the morning and catch their coverage, uh, before the 8, 8, 8 o'clock shift comes in, and that would be 8 o'clock San Diego time, you'll get a much different read on the exact same stories than you will after 8 a.m. when the rest of the crew comes in, and when the editor comes in, who is in his case actually the owner as well. So it absolutely can play a large role, but I haven't done a whole lot of work to make a determination as to, for example, the role that Amazon particularly would play. Um, I, I, I can't answer that part. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's safe to. It's not. It didn't excite anyone to have kind of what we're seeing uh, as as Dr. Brosman hit on is just more uh, more big media companies controlled by uh, fewer people. Uh, and so, in the case of Washington Post, again, yeah, I don't, I don't know if uh, that has impacted their coverage, other than to, that every time they write about Jeff Bezos, they have to put in the caveat that Amazon's the owner of Washington Post. Um, but just because it doesn't today doesn't mean that it won't tomorrow. And so, I think that's something that is a huge concern to to a lot of people. In the same way that uh, the new media that is springing up, and when we talk about media growth, it's generally national media growth. Uh, but that is funded by a lot of times people that we don't know, venture capitalists. Uh, and so the ways that journalists need to go uh, to get funding, um, I think, is, is going to be problematic. It's going to be part of the storyline, too, because it's mm -hmm. not going to be as transparent as it was in the old days when you had scripts on a bunch of newspapers and you had the Pulitzer family and, and all these kind of big traditional news organizations. That's not the case anymore. You have a huge conglomerate. NBC uh, is owned by Comcast. So having a cable channel that is owned by a cable provider uh, mm -hmm. is a potentially a huge problem. It got through Congress. We, we're seeing now on like some of the grandiose plans uh, that they've had in place, but Walt Disney owning ABC News, all of these, just these mm -hmm. places. Uh, and just because it's not a, a concern today doesn't mean it shouldn't be tomorrow. Thank you. Did you want to add something, Brent? No, I just okay. thought that was a good answer. I appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Uh, we have three or four more questions, and I see we're at about 9.02, so let's... Um, one of the questions that came up, uh, the Russian bounties on the American troops. Um, this was the first... There was a report, I'm sorry, uh, report that was released, and the first opportunity to press to directly ask the president such a question. Um, Andrew? Do you get frustrated by your peers for not asking questions you think should be asked? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that, you know, when it comes to the White House, and this isn't something that Trump's done, it goes back to mm -hmm. Bill Clinton. They stack the White House uh, and the, the reporters in the back row can sometimes be very obscure uh, outlets that are ideologically aligned with that White House. And so uh, anyone who's watched some of these president um, uh, coronavirus briefings, you'll often hear a question from a reporter for OAN, and it seems like it's just totally out of left field because it is. Uh, and again, this isn't a Trump phenomenon. This has been going on really since Bill Clinton. And so uh, I think generally, I, I've been very impressed with the White House press court and the job they're doing. Uh, but certainly, uh, they drop the ball, as we all do in any profession at times. Thanks. Uh, there's a, a broader question. Uh, do you think the 24-7 news cycle and the rush to be the first to report a story um, that journalists now put themselves in more dangerous situations, especially as we saw with the recent civil unrest, and you touched on this briefly about the relationship of media with the administration, but um, the intent of more shock and awe than to communicate and showcase what is really happening in communities? May, may I? Sure. So uh, in terms of the danger element, I don't know that that part is true. I do think that media for a long time have been putting themselves in really dangerous spots to get the story, right? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't matter when the story breaks, if you're not there to see it, you don't get the same level of coverage. You know, and we can go back to Vietnam, we can go back much further than that, and media were risking themselves. So for that part, I don't think so. But yes, I do think that the notion of trying to break the story first uh, has changed a lot. Some of it's a 24 hour news cycle. Some of it's trying to keep up with social media uh, and with the individuals who are, who are able to break anything they want off of their cell phone and send something on Twitter or whatever and start a story, et cetera. And certainly one of the major implications of that is that we jump the gun on stories a lot. We end up thinking that we have a full picture long before we have a full picture. And so that we have to then end up backtracking on some things because it, we didn't have a complete picture. And I think while that also has always occurred, I think it, it must necessarily occur more frequently when we don't give ourselves enough time to make sure we have the story, to make sure we have multiple sources, to make sure that we've verified other things because we have this tremendous rush to, to be the first one to, to break it. Yeah, and just a quick point on that is there's also a problem where you have 
uh, information that otherwise would not warrant uh, headlines being played up as bigger news than it is because of that pressure too. And I think there's a lot of palace intrigue, especially in this White House, uh, where reporters, very good reporters, spend a lot of time reporting on so and so is out of the president's good graces, or these things that really don't impact uh, everyday mm -hmm. in any way that we spend a lot of time on because they either do well on social or a lot of people click on them. And that's another part of this. Okay, thank you. Um, how concerned are you about the appearance that supporters of the president have stopped caring or even pretending to care that he does not tell the truth? How does the media respond to a public for whom truth does not seem to really matter? Yeah, that's, uh, okay. <laughs> that's a tough one to say in a couple minutes. Um, but I think that I, I think that one of the things we learned from 2016 is that we need to do a better job we being the media and going out and talking to people who support the president and understanding why they support him because they don't support him uh, because he's the uh, intellectual uh, uh, truth teller. Uh, they support him for a lot of other reasons. And that's something that we were blindsided by uh, in 2016, which was uh, quite honestly embarrassing uh, for national media. Uh, to push these narratives and then just totally get it wrong. Uh, and I'm not even talking about the polls. I'm just talking about uh, then just putting like these Trump supporters in this kind of experimental looking glass and like poking around and saying, oh, we're, you know, we're trying to understand the Trump supporter. No, it's just because you didn't have a good grasp on where the country was. Uh, and so it's really important to understand why people who support the president do so, uh, because we know uh, that we know why things that don't matter them, to them. So clearly that they're, they're voting for him because of things that are important. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they do think he tells the truth on the issues that are most important to them and don't care about other issues, right? Um, and, and on some things that seem clear to some people, you know, if, if the source of media that you go to affirms what the president tells you, then that does sound an awful lot more like the truth than whatever you might be hearing elsewhere, especially if that element has been identified as the fake news. But we very clearly have reached a point where only certain issues matter and the rest of it, you know, the bravado, the bluster, the I'm taking everything down, I'm challenging, et cetera, the hyperbole, that all sort of fits an image that's helpful uh, and, and appreciated. Uh, I would also back off on um, one claim. Uh, I, I do think at the end of the day, the polls in 2016 were, uh, the polls were accurate. It was the interpretation of the polls that was inaccurate. Uh, I will beat the drum for Nate Silver all the time here. I, I'll admit that bias, but you know, three days before the, the election, Nate wrote and got blasted in the media for this. Look, there won't be any polls over the next three days but if we look at the seven states that are the swing states in here, and we look at what's happened in the last two weeks, there's a trajectory where he keeps gaining and gaining, and the lead for Hillary keeps shrinking in those seven states. The other 43 are irrelevant. They're decided, but in these seven, he needs to take all seven of them, but it is possible that he will, because the decline would suggest that it, the, if it continues at the same trajectory over the next three days, he has a good shot at eclipsing that mark in each of those seven. And that's exactly what ended up happening. At the end of the day, Hillary still won the popular vote by really close to what she was predicted to win the popular vote for. She just didn't win those seven states. And he was the one analyst who saw that trajectory and was, again, blasted for, uh, but we don't do any polling in the last three days before an election. That's just, it's just not done. Yeah, so. they're actually more accurate in 2016 than they were in 2012 national polls. Yeah. So we have one last question for our panelists. Um, could you talk about news coverage from a Catholic perspective? Yeah, okay. Do you, do you want to start this? No, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I do think, uh, kind of going back to my original point, is that the media does not do a great job of covering religion. Uh, and so that certainly involves Catholicism. Joe Biden's a, a Catholic, right? Uh, and so um, that I don't actually come to think of it, haven't really seen that story uh, anywhere. Uh, and, and that surprises me. So uh, I think that when we, when we in politics as political journalists usually cover religion, we do it for Protestant evangelical voters because they're so important to the Republican Party. Uh, and so the Catholic perspective often does get 
boss, but I'd be interested to hear if this person has uh, any pers any uh, interest or any ideas on what the media does or doesn't get right uh, when it comes to covering Catholicism. I mean, obviously, uh, they're all over when, uh, when something bad happens. Uh, and this is a more popular pope than we've had in a, in a long time. And so that's nice to get that sort of coverage. Um, but uh, and in general, yeah, I think the uh, newsrooms across the country, uh, usually the religion is, is unfortunately one of the, one of the earlier uh, positions to cut when it comes to budgeting and, and think yeah. about newsrooms. Let me start by, by asking or saying that I wish Father Emilou were here. For all yes. I know, he might have been the one who wrote the question. Uh, but, <laughs> he did uh, not. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, the question is, at what point is Catholicism a relevant factor or a relevant element to a national story? And when it is, I think the media picks that up. But oftentimes, just as we don't have a Yes, when anti-Semitism is occurring, that story gets picked up. Uh, yes, when Israeli relations are at part, that story gets picked up. But the rest of the time, I don't know that we get a particularly Jewish perspective of the media or a Muslim perspective of the media or any of these uh, others as well. Uh, certainly, there are organizations who do that. There are Catholic news organizations, Catholic news agency, Catholic news service, a few others who who do look at the news from a particular way, but like any other division, I would suspect that you would get your best coverage of that perspective from an organization that dedicates themselves to that perspective. Um, for, for my sense, as a, as a Catholic, it's probably best when the Catholics are not particularly in the news, uh, because if they are, then it's probably for a, a relatively negative thing. Uh, unless it is, again, uh, as Andrew is pointing out, uh, Pope Francis has obviously uh, been, been generally very, uh, very much perceived in a positive light. And so uh, when he's, you know, traveling, the, well, no one's traveling the world at the moment, but when he was traveling the world and saying things, uh, that generated perspectives there as well. Um, I don't know that, that that's a satisfactory answer to the question, but that's the best I can do. Thank you both. Uh, we're going to go to Dave Vitito. Thank you, uh, Dr. Panukin, Dr. Brosman, Andrew Rafferty. Uh, thank you for an enlightening discussion tonight. I hope everyone found it helpful as we navigate the information coming at us on a daily basis and differentiate those sources uh, of information moving forward. And I have to say, one of the more mind-blowing uh, moments of the night came from Dr. Brosman with this notion of uh, a bad actor being able to, to, to manipulate audio and video of a public figure to say whatever that bad actor wants them to say. That's, uh, that's frightening. And uh, that's where we're headed. God help us. But um, uh, really a wonderful and, and informative night. So we thank you all. Uh, if we did not get to your questions tonight, uh, we will get the panelists uh, to respond to those questions and send those to you in a wrap up email with the video link to this webinar. And finally, I, I wanna thank all who attended our summer session of ACES and thank our staff in alumni relations for helping to organize these offerings. Uh, Eric Eikhoff, Carla Gall, Chelsea McTighe, and Pam Zangara, uh, thank you for your tireless dedication and service to our alumni. Our fall semester of ACES is set to return in September as we explore topics ranging from beer and brewing industries to space exploration with alumnus and astronaut Carl Walls to the uh, 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, and uh, another ho-hum topic, the 2020 election, uh, and that one will feature CBS News political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns from the class of 2009. And as a reminder, registration for all of these JCU alumni programs is free. Visit jcu.edu slash alumni or follow us on social media at JCU alumni for more details. Thank you all again. We hope to see you real soon and God bless.